So today's sermon is no other way, no higher joy. No other way, no higher joy. In a, in a couple of minutes, we're going to be turning to our primary scripture for today, which is from Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 10, verses 21 through 24. And let me tell you that you really want to be paying attention to this passage of scripture. I hope that, you know, following up on the emails that I sent out to you, that you read the scripture each weekend heading into the Sunday for your spiritual preparation. I definitely hope that you focused on Luke 10, 21 through 24, because among others, James Edwards, the great New Testament uh, writer and scholar, calls this the most, the most exultant description of Jesus in all of Scripture. The most exultant description of Jesus in all of Scripture. And we're going to be coming to a verse, actually the second in the sequence of the verses we read today, that, back to the whole Scott emphasis, the great Scott New Testament scholar, Archibald McBride Hunter, who taught New Testament Greek and New Testament at Aberdeen, for a number of decades, the latter half of the 20th century, says that Luke chapter 10, verse 22, is perhaps the most important verse in all the synoptic gospels. To translate that, that means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But first, let's remember our context. We, on Palm Sunday, as well as this past Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, focused in on the preceding passage, which is massive and magisterial in its own right, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. Let me remind you of that. I'll read that to you. The 72 returned with joy, with joy. Luke is the one emphasizing the joy here, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he, Jesus, said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, an amazing apocalyptic vision of Jesus that, as we've mentioned, as I've mentioned, pretty much totally gives you much of the book of Revelation that we're studying on Tuesday mornings. And then Jesus goes on and says this, Behold, I have given you authority to trample serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice about this, that, you're, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, following from that, Jesus has spoken to his 72 missionary disciples, real disciples, not just people who said, I want to believe in you, Jesus, but I'm too busy right now. The guys who actually went out in mission, he's saying this to them. Now he's going to turn to God, his Father. And so we're coming to uh, the great Trinitarian prayer of praise and thanksgiving that we're going to read in these verses for today. We're going to be looking at the, this is massive for, for you. You ought to be in awe of this. I'm in awe of this. To have a little glimpse into the divine communion of joy within and among the Godhead. Within and among the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So hear now God's word from Luke chapter 10, verses 21 through 24. In that same hour, he, Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the learned and so-called wise and, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and whomever the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples in private, he said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings wish to see the things you see, and they did not see them and to hear the things you hear, and they did not hear them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So, no other way, no higher joy. 
was reading an interview of Tim Tebow, who, of course, is a Heisman Trophy winning football player, former football player, who you may see in football programs and SEC analysis and this type of thing. But you know, that's just kind of what he does. That's like the, the mom who does the laundry job at night to make sure she can do her real job <laughs> during the day. Because Tim Tebow's real job is he's a Christian, which means he's involved in mission. I mean, anybody who's truly alive, born again in Jesus is going to be wanting to just called, compelled to get involved in mission out to other people. And Tim Tebow definitely is a man of the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about in this interview about his mission ministry that he funds through all the other things that he does. And he says, talking about his ministry to um, rescue women and men, young girls and young boys involved in human trafficking and sex trafficking, he says this. And then you get there and you realize, you know what? Yeah, some of them are sold by some terrible people, but a majority of these young girls and boys were sold by their own family or loved ones. It just opens your heart and it wrecks you. He says, how do you tell a young girl what love is supposed to look like when the person that sold her is her dad? How do you tell a person what a heavenly father is like when that's her earthly father? How do you tell someone that a mom is supposed to nurture her when for one of those first four young girls that we helped with his dad, this is some years ago, she didn't make enough money one day, the mom didn't, and she comes home and boils out her eye. How do you tell someone, how do you frame their view of what a heavenly father, of what love, of what family, of what hope, faith? These words that we sometimes take for granted. How amazing it is for the blessings that God has put into our lives. And we realize, wait a second, how can I share the gospel with someone when their view of what love is, is actually betrayal? That's something Tim Tebow says that wrecked me for a long time. And I still want it to wreck me because when God wrecked me with that, he also inspired me to do something about it. So our team is working hard in that area of the world he's talking about. Just a year ago, we were able to set up 18 more safe homes and we're building and, and they're doing rescues and restoration of young girls and boys. There's so many of these young girls and boys and they're getting chances. It's not because of me, it's because of God and an amazing team with official partners and supporters that we have. You know, it takes a miracle in a fallen world for anyone, whether they've been a victim of human sex trafficking or something else, to actually know the glorious God who is so far above anything that we experience in our fallenness and in our sin. Well, it turns out there's no other way unless God himself would come to us, right? There's no other way unless God himself would graciously reveal himself to us. So let's remember the road work. I'll just cover this briefly. We've covered this for the last couple months throughout the Lenten season heading into Holy Week, the road work, the way of the cross mission for Jesus himself, for Christ as the son of man. Remember, he says, um, Luke chapter nine, verse 22, it is necessary, day, okay, it's necessary, it must happen. It is necessary for the Son of Man, Jesus is claiming his title as not only the one who will judge, but before that, the one who will suffer as the Son of Man on our behalf. It is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things, to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, the re religious leaders of the Jews, the, those different categories of the Sanhedrin, to be killed, 
and on the third day to be raised. Uh, we've really focused the last month or so on what I refer to as the pivotal verse that leads to your salvation and leads to the, the next chapter of Jesus' story of his saving work for us, Luke 9, 51. You remember this. As the days were being fulfilled for his ascension, he, Jesus, set his face to go to Jerusalem. Praise God he did, right? Otherwise, you and I are lost. Then we talked about the way of mission of the cross for every Christian. It turns out this is not just for Jesus. He's calling us into this mission. If anyone wants to come after me, he says, Luke 9, 23, he must, you must, he must deny himself. Deny, deny ourselves. It's all about the selves nowadays, but no, 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 deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. This is the mission of the cross is for every Christian. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, don't show up at a rally, don't show up at a worship service on Sunday and tell me you're all in, but then look back. Jesus says you have nothing of the kingdom. Now, is there a possibility of repentance and turning again to the Lord? Yeah, absolutely. He's gracious, okay, un un until the last day, right? But the people who claim to be Christian and aren't engaged in the mission, Jesus says, you have, you're not in the kingdom. Okay, if you don't gather with me, you're scattering. So this mission that he gives us is daunting. No question about it. Truth in advertising. Jesus says, go, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. But now this brings us to joy, the emphasis on joy that Luke is highlighting in a way that Matthew does not in some of the parallel passages here. Luke is really focusing us from his witnesses on how much joy there was in Jesus and the disciples. The 72 returned with joy. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Well, that takes us not from their joy. Let's go higher, to high joy. The Beatitudes of Jesus. And notice we, we, we get another Beatitude in our key passage for today. Okay? This Beatitude connects in Luke 10. Connects back with this one. Look. Blessed are you. This is from the Sermon on the Level. Luke 6. Blessed are you when people hate you. On account of the Son of Man, rejoice, leap for joy. Be happy about this. This is rejoicing. Because people are opposed to you. People are opposed to the fact that you're a Christian. This is good news. This is awesome news. Rejoice in this. For your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to all the prophets who came before you. And then again, Luke 10, 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice about this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice in what I give you. Rejoice in what is yours forever, not in what you do on earth. So we're called a mission, but we're not supposed to focus on the mission, right? We, we haven't done anything. It's all been given to us from God in the first place, and the awesome thing to rejoice in is that he, by his grace, writes our name in heaven. So that brings us then to no higher joy and what we hit today, which is incredible. I mean, it's amazing that God gives this to us. Luke 10, 21 through 24. I hope you've been meditating on it. If you have not yet, I want to encourage you to do it now. Jesus' Trinitarian prayer of praise and thanksgiving within the Godhead. I mean, can you, this is awesome. We are allowed to get this little glimpse into the Godhead and the communion of God himself revealing God's own expression of God's mind, God's will, God's ways. The Father with the Son exalting through the Holy Spirit. It's Trinitarian. It's the, the divine communion of joy within and among the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. Look at this, Luke 10, 21. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Okay, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the learned and wise and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for thus it was your gracious will, or literally, your pleasure. This pleases you. It pleases the Father to reveal the glories of his saving grace 
to people who are not thinking they're so big shot and not so smart, but people who humbly come to him. Y'all see what Jesus is saying? And Jesus is rejoicing in this. This is the way the Father works. This is who the Father is. Uh, the Greek here, agelion, which is unusual in the New Testament. It's a, it's a, it's, I don't think there's a hapax legomen. I think this may be twice in the New Testament. But it's the most exultant description of Jesus in all of Scripture. I mean, all the way through. All the way through Revelation. This is the most exultant description of Jesus, according to James Edwards, and I think he's right on this. The great 18th century German New Testament theologian, Bingal, in his Nomen of the New Testament, says that this is the crowning point of the fruits of Christ's office revealed and reached at this time. I mean, we're really supposed to pay attention to this. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the learned and wise and reveal them to little children. The Greek there for the little children is nepios, okay? It means not an infant. Sometimes you'll see it translated as infant. It's not an infant. It means like a preschooler like kind of three, four, five years old, okay? It's little, little children. That's who comes into the kingdom. You know, Jesus keeps teaching about this. Well, here he is talking to the Father about it and celebrating how awesome this is. Not the big shots, not the smart people that everybody flocks to hear what they have to say. It was fascinating this past week, it, with Holy Week and Easter, to see the interview with Richard Dawkins. Did y'all see it? Richard Dawkins, you know, famous, one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent, of the new atheists of the early 21st century. I mean, these guys dominated the headlines in the first decade and heading into the second decade of this century. Uh, Dawkins, of course, English, a great uh, professor, of science and uh, writer Dawkins wrote The God Delusion, which was pretty much the signature book of the new atheist um, about uh, 17 years ago. Well, Dawkins in an interview is uh, this past week was concerned that Great Britain is now becoming pretty chaotic, that the boundaries are leaving and he's concerned about the dominance of Ramadan in Great Britain now and he's concerned, Dawkins is, about how things have gotten out of control with the progressive agenda and the LGBTQ agenda and all the neo-paganism. And he, it's hilarious. I mean, Dawkins, who really tried to tear down Christianity for decades, right, is now concerned about, be careful what you wish for. Do you hear what I'm saying? Be careful what you wish for. So Daw Dawkins uh, says, look, I'm a cultural Christian. I don't believe in Jesus, and it was probably good that a lot of this superstition of Christianity got blown away, but now he's worried about the loss of his Christian England. He says, I like Christmas carols. I like Christmas services. I like for people to be nice to each other and not terroristic towards each other. I like for there to be an understanding of what a man is and what a woman is. And so he's, wor he's worried about, uh, you know, as the Bible says, what you sow, you will reap. So he says, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith, I want to live in a culturally Christian country because it's civilized. Interesting, yeah? But he doesn't know Jesus yet because what did Jesus just tell us? For him to know the Father, for Dawkins or anybody to know the Father, and for Dawkins to know Jesus, God himself must be gracious and open. And the truth is, Dawkins is gonna need to come not as the smartest guy in the room, but as a three or four year old to God. No other way. This passage, if you're into theology and into Reformed theology, let me just tell you, it is power-packed. Reformed theology, oh yes, totally focusing on 
God's exclusive, did you hear that? Yes, exclusive, no other way, sovereignty over who receives revelation, election, saving knowledge of the Father and the Son, and who sees and rejoices in the kingdom. It's all there. And also, if you're into theology, this is full of theology proper, Trinitarian theology, Christology, and soteriology, as well as eschatology. I know I just blew you away with all these ologies. I'm just telling you, it's all there in these little verses. It explodes with all of the things I just mentioned. So Jesus says, all things, did you catch that? Not most things, all things, have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and who, whomever the Son chooses to reveal him. This hyperlinks with what Jesus says, recorded in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. Catch this now. No one comes to the Father except what? Through me. This is why Archibald Hunter, in his classic article, The Crux Criticorum, that he wrote back decades ago, calls this perhaps the most important verse of the Synoptic Gospels. Now, before I move on and close out on this passage of scripture, let me just pull back and also tell you, with the eclipse coming tomorrow, I was reminded to turn to, this is a book that you know, some of you picked up when I recommended it, heading into 2020, uh, Tom Holland's Dominion, the Making of the Western Mind, um, which really focuses on Christendom. Now, you may remember that I told you Tom Holland, at the time he wrote this, was agnostic decidedly agnostic, not a born-again Christian at all. But he's probably the most brilliant writer of massive history in our lifetime. So Holland's story of the West as being totally influenced and grounded and founded in Christian values was fascinating, groundbreaking in 2019. It was shocking that this English agnostic would hail Christianity as key to all of our great values in the Western world. So anyway, again, I encourage you to read that, but in the midst of that, I was reminded that Holland tells a story, I mean, he's all over the place. He covers a huge swath of history. And in his chapter on cosmos, he moves from the new world, the colonies, over to China in 1629 and then into the mid 1600s. And he talks about the fact that the Chinese who believed that the emperor who was divine controlled the calendar and that under Confucian ideology and the emperor's divine sovereignty that everything that happened in the stars could be totally mandated by the emperor. When the Chinese scientific community that served the emperor got the eclipse wrong in 1629, their minds were blown. They didn't know what to do about it. And wouldn't you know, there were Jesuit missionaries, one of whom was a great scientist who was a colleague of Galileo, who was able to correctly determine when eclipses and earthquakes were gonna happen on a calendar. And the emperor's court was blown away by this. And there's all this back and forth that Holland goes into, but in the end, several of the key leaders of the Chinese intelligentsia became Christian. And so these Jesuits were allowed to educate within the Chinese system because it turned out their foundational values of a creator and clear truth that are the foundation of science, by the way, were superior to Confucian ideology. Fascinating, isn't it? Because it turns out the smartest people in China in the 1600s did not have all the answers. You know, no human being actually has all the answers. Did you know that? In fact, the really smart human beings have very few answers. They know how to deconstruct but they don't know how to build and how to save. 
and how truly to rejoice. Which brings us back to no other way, no higher choice, no higher joy. Uh, Crump, in his book, uh, Jesus the Intercessor, lays out, it's a chiasm, this passage gives us a chiasm on the prayer. On the prayer, it totally gives us a chiasm. Now, follow this. I've, I've got it up on the screen for you. I hope you can follow. So A is, Jesus says, I thank you, Father, for revealing the Son to whomever you choose. In other words, he's totally sold out on the way that God is in total sovereignty over, by his grace, revealing to whomever he chooses. Now then follow to the B. Only the Father knows the Son, so we're getting really personal and specific here. Only the Father knows the Son. So therefore, the center of the chiasm is C. Okay, y'all picking up on this? Only the Father can reveal the Son. Now pull back to off B. Likewise, only the Son knows the Father. So therefore, off A, only the Son can reveal the Father to whomever the Son chooses. It's all through God. And the chiasm points to the center that for the Jews of the first century, for the Chinese of the 17th century, for the British, and for that matter, the Americans of the 21st century, you're only going to know Jesus as the one true Savior, and he is the one true Savior, if God in his grace brings the revelation. And God chooses in his great pleasure to bring the revelation to little children. If you don't enjoy being a little child in the Father's presence, you probably won't know part of Jesus. If you're willing to be a little child, he may be gracious. The scripture says he will to everyone who turns to him and bring the revelation, the election, the salvation. So, no other way, no higher joy. Then turning to the disciples in private, Jesus said, here's the beatitude. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For many prophets and kings wish to see the things you see, and they do not see them, and to hear the things that you hear and they did not hear them. Blessed indeed are you. Christian, Christian, blessed are you. You've seen what only God can reveal and you know God personally. Everything else in this world pales in comparison. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit now and forever, amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.